Hey everyone, in this video I am going to finish up our discussion on climate and biogeography. In our last lesson together, we left off talking about the global circulation patterns. And so um, with an understanding of the easterlies and the westerlies and the trade winds and all of those different cells, the Hadley, Feral, and Polar cells, um, we can get a pretty good idea of which way the winds are going um, and um, whether the air is going to be hot or cold. And then today I'm going to elaborate on um, essentially uh, how that influences um, weather patterns in terms of precipitation. Uh, so uh, before we get there, I want to point out that these wind patterns ultimately are going to influence the, um, the systemic patterns of surface water movement. Um, of course, there's a lot more um, to the story if we're talking about deeper into the ocean, uh, but the surface water ultimately moves in um, a few major circular patterns called gyres. Uh, and so um, as we can see here, uh, the surface waters are moving clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Remember, um, the two hemispheres are always um, uh, essentially a mirror image of one another. Um, and we can have, or we have, five major gyres um, in the surface waters throughout the world. Um, of course, you might be the most familiar with this one right here, uh, because this is where the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch is. So essentially, those surface waters carry um, trash, carry debris from um, the east coast of Asia, from the west coast of North America, and ultimately funnels all of that trash into one gigantic and very sad um, patch of trash floating in the ocean. Uh, temperature, uh, of course, we've been talking a lot about temperature in terms of um, latitude, in terms of um, where the solar radiation is um, absorbed the most by the earth, by the water. Um, and so uh, temperature itself is further going to influence the moisture content of the air. Um, at all times, uh, water is evaporating into the air um, and condensing. So essentially, um, you know, forming fog, forming clouds, and then uh, condensing, either forming dew or precipitation. Uh, of course, uh, you're probably familiar with the concept that uh, as the temperature increases, right, so here we have a little like Bunsen burner underneath the water, heating up the water, that actually increases the rate of evaporation. And so we can imagine that um, around the equator where uh, the temperatures are very warm all year round, uh, the rate of evaporation and therefore the adding of uh, water molecules to the air is going to be a lot faster. Okay. Uh, the uh, evaporated water molecules ultimately exert a pressure, just like any other gas within the air. Um, it exerts a pressure. Um, again, hot air is going to hold more water than cold air does, and that's going to be very important for weather patterns throughout the world. Uh, relative humidity, we see this all the time, like on our weather apps, on the uh, news. Uh, relative humidity is... Um, the water vapor in the air now compared to the total possible water vapor that can be in the air. And so this graph from your textbook um, shows us, uh, well, shows us a lot of different things, but first of all, on the x-axis, it shows increasing temperature, vapor pressure, so essentially how much water is in the air and how much pressure that water is exerting, um, and this red curve here um, is the saturation vapor pressure. And so first take home message is that um, warmer air can hold more water before um, that, uh, that dew point, that uh, temperature at which um, uh, the condensation is going to happen, All right? Condensation, precipitation. Okay. Um, another thing that we can see here is, uh, you know, we can get a pretty good idea of the relative humidity. So, for example, if the current air temperature is a nice balmy 25 degrees Celsius, um, the total amount of water Right, the total vapor pressure that can be held by this temperature of the air currently right this moment is 3.2 kilopascals. Right, so just a, a unit for the vapor pressure, how much water is in, can be held in the air. Right, so that's the saturation vapor pressure. Um, so the 
air currently at 25 degrees Celsius can hold that much water. In reality, at this particular moment, the current vapor pressure is only two kilopascals, right? So it can actually hold more water than it's holding now. And so we can calculate the relative humidity, right, by two over 3.2 times 100. Okay, so the percentage of the current vapor pressure over the total possible vapor pressure. Now, of course, at the end of the day, the sun is going to set, the air is going to cool off. And as the air cools, we see that the saturation vapor pressure goes down. And so as we continue to get cooler and cooler, what may happen is that the saturation vapor pressure reaches the current vapor pressure here. So it has been reduced to the current vapor pressure as the sun goes down and the air cools off. Um, as soon as this curve, saturation vapor pressure, crosses the current vapor pressure line, or meets that current vapor pressure line, um, that is what is called the dew point temperature. So essentially the temperature at which you will start to see dew, see condensation out on the grass. Okay, so that's why um, in the morning when it's nice and cool, you see the grass might be wet um, because the temperature cooled off so much at night that it reached that dew point. Okay, um, also, uh, whenever air cools, um, for example, as it is rising, right, so warm air rising, um, temperature is going to cool. We'll look at that more in a moment. Um, the As soon as that dew point temperature is reached, you get condensation and possibly precipitation. Okay. And so I want to talk a little bit more about this, um, this concept of air cooling and warming as it changes in altitude, that is, as it rises or as it falls. Um, this process, this phenomenon, is called adiabatic process. Okay, so it's the heating or cooling of a body of air um, without any energy exchange. That is, you're not lighting a Bunsen burner, you're not um, you know, using an air conditioner to cool the air down. Instead, this is simply air that is changing pressure, and as a result, it is changing uh, temperature as well. And so um, I feel like we've all experienced this before, like maybe you have a can of hairspray, maybe you have um, a can of cooking spray. Um, in that can, um, the liquid is very highly compressed, right? It's really high pressure within that can. And so as soon as you push down the top, what happens is, of course, some of that liquid is going to be released, in turn, reducing the pressure very quickly inside the can. And so as that pressure is reduced, you might notice that the can of hairspray or the can of cooking spray, can of um, shaving cream even, the can gets cold, right? You didn't um, put it in the refrigerator or anything, but somehow the can got colder. Uh, and so that is an example of the adiabatic process. So you start out with really high pressure in the can, you reduce the pressure significantly by letting out some of that fluid, and as a result, the can gets colder. And so the same exact thing is going to happen as air increases in altitude. Um, so uh, the closer you are to Earth, right, to sea level, um, the more atmospheric pressure there is. And so as you go up in altitude, as you climb a mountain, or in our examples here, as the air rises, right, because it's hot, for example, the air is going to experience less atmospheric pressure. And so that same volume of air is going to be able to expand, therefore reducing pressure. Same thing is happening in your can of hairspray. Um, as the air expands, has less pressure, um, it is going to cool down. Okay? Um, and so if you've ever driven up a mountain, um, you know, or ever, you know, kind of lost, uh, lost pressure in uh, an airplane cabin, um, or if you look out the window, you see like icicles on the uh, on the window sometimes when you're in a plane, um, essentially that cooling is just due to the fact that there's less pressure higher up in altitude. Okay, so um, take home message here, as air rises, like we've been talking about, warm air rises, it is going to expand and it's going to cool down. 
Okay? As air falls, it becomes more compressed. It experiences more of that atmospheric pressure, and so it gets compressed into a smaller space, and it actually gets warmer. And so we can see in this image that as the air rises, it cools, and as it descends, it's going to heat up. Right, without any kind of energy input whatsoever. Okay, um, so here uh, it just written out for you. Um, ultimately, because of this adiabatic process, the air is going to cool at about 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer increase in altitude. Okay, and that's if it's dry. So if there's not a lot of water vapor already in the air, um, if the air is more humid, it's about five degrees Celsius per kilometer increase in altitude. Uh, so this should make sense. We're going to come back to this. Um, it takes um, a lot more energy, a lot more time um, to change the temperature of water compared to air or land. Okay, So air cools at a predictable rate, um, whether it's wet or dry, as it increases in altitude. A adiabatic process, really important. Be prepared to talk about it on a test or apply it to different circumstances. Now, let's apply it to um, a couple different phenomena in the world. Okay, uh, so let's go back to our uh, circulation map. Okay, uh, focusing here on this intertropical convergence zone. Right, the ITCZ, uh, for the most part around the equator, but of course this moves a little bit according to season. I'll get into that here momentarily. Um, but as we know, uh, air around the equator uh, is uh, is going to be really warm, okay? uh, because this part of the world is receiving the most solar radiation and direct sunlight. Okay. Uh, also, because of the heat, it's going to have a lot of moisture, right? So the warmer the water is, the warmer the air is, the more evaporation is going to take place, okay? So really humid, really hot air. And as we discussed in our last lesson, uh, this air is going to rise, right? But now, as we know, um, as the air rises, it's going to expand and it's going to cool, right? As the air cools, it is going to reach that dew point. Right, which means that that moisture that just evaporated from you know, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, from these waterways here, that water that just evaporated is going to condense into clouds and precipitation is going to occur. And so around this, this one latitude, this one ring around the Earth, um, there is going to be a high level of rainfall because of the rising um, wet air condensing and precipitating in this area. Okay, and so if we look at this precipitation map, we see the most precipitation in blue, the least precipitation in red. And so right around this, right around the equator, we see a lot of blue, right? So lots of rainforests um, because um, of this adiabatic process. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the subtropical highs, uh, and so uh, these places are where that cooler air is going to descend in the Hadley cell, they're going to experience very low levels of rainfall. Okay, so much so that if we look around where the Hadley cell descends, we see the Sahara Desert. Right? We see lots of deserts, even in the Southern Hemisphere, right? Reds and yellows, the only reds and yellows that we see are around this particular latitude. And so what's happening here is that um, as the warm, moist air rises here and precipitation occurs, uh, essentially the air that is traveling away from the equator, away from this intertropical convergence zone, it, it's going to be dry, right? So it just lost all that moisture, dumped it out on the equator. And now um, the cooler air um, that is going to descend, that has a very low humidity, and therefore, um, there's going to be very little rainfall at this area. All right? And again, we see exactly that. We see lots of deserts um, around in this, uh, what's called subtropical high, so high pressure, low precipitation area. Uh, to look at this phenomenon graphically, uh, once again, we have a graph in which um, the Earth is mapped out. Here is the North Pole moving down to the equator, moving down to the South Pole. 
Okay. Um, on uh, this x-axis, we see annual precipitation, or actually on both, we see annual precipitation. Um, up at the top, these are those cells that we talked about, the two Hadley, feral, and polar cells. Okay. Um, at the intertropical convergence zone, so think around the equator, warm, uh, humid air rises, condenses, and precipitation. So we see the most precipitation around the equator. Okay. Moisture is lost here, and so very dry air is going to descend at this subtropical low, or sorry, subtropical high area, and so we see the least uh, precipitation here. So we see lower precipitation here. Again, the warm human, warmer humid air rises here. Condensation, precipitation, and so we see a little spike in precipitation here as well. Um, and uh, just to kind of finish this out, um, around the two poles, we see again, uh, really cold, very dry air descending, and so almost no precipitation here. Um, at either pole, that is. Um, so we can see how these uh, these circulation patterns in the air play a huge role in how much precipitation an area gets. Um, and I've been talking about um, this intertropical convergence zone. For the most part, um, it is around the equator. But uh, we do see that this intertropical convergence zone does move with the seasons. And remember that this is because um, the Earth is not facing the sun directly at all times, right? So the equator is not receiving the majority of the direct sunlight all the time. Um, that is only during the autumn and the spring. Um, during the northern hemisphere summer, the sun shines directly on the Tropic of Cancer. And so that is what determines where this um, where this warm, humid air is going to start rising. Okay, so um, around uh, the June solstice, so the summer solstice for the northern hemisphere, this intertropical convergence zone between the two Hadley cells, that is actually going to shift up to the Tropic of Cancer. Okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, when the northern hemisphere is in its winter, Right? It is facing away from the sun. What is receiving direct sunlight is the Tropic of Capricorn. So again, this um, intertropical convergence zone migrates southward, right? And it is, um, it is straddling this uh, Tropic of Capricorn. Okay? And so what that means for uh, tropical places uh, on either side of the equator is that sometimes, or there are some periods of the year that receive a ton of rain. There are other periods of the year that receive very little rain, okay? Um, so even if there is not a huge variation in temperature around the equator, there is a huge variation in moisture and precipitation. Uh, and so uh, organisms that live in these places, of course, may not need to have adaptations for cold versus hot, but they do need to have adaptations to withstand periods of little rain and periods of a ton of rain. And so let's look at this graph up here in the top right. Um, this is a climate graph for Brazil. So this is Southern Hemisphere, um, but still uh, kind of near the equator, right? Um, the line at the top uh, is temperature. And so what we can see is that from January to December all year long, the temperature remains relatively the same. So organisms living in Brazil you know, that they experience um, very consistent temperatures. But there are still seasons in Brazil, not in terms of temperature, but in terms of rainfall. They have a rainy season and they have a dry season. And so the bars on this graph are showing us the rainfall. What we can see is that in January, February, March, April, and even in December, um, there is a ton of rain. Okay, lots of rain. Um, whereas in June, July, August, there is very little rain. And so remember that in the southern hemisphere, the summer months are 
what we would call the winter months. So January, February, March, this is solidly the summertime. And so during the summer in the Southern Hemisphere, this intertropical convergence zone has shifted south. You get tons of rain because there's so much um, direct sunlight on this area. Okay, so again, um, season, we might think of as just differences in temperature or differences in maybe type of precipitation. Is it snowing or is it raining? But not everywhere on Earth experiences the same um, type of seasons. Some is wet versus dry. Others are hot versus cold. Topography also influences climate. So not just latitude, but topography as well. Um, this is another example of the adiabatic process and how it influences climate. Uh, what we can see in this image down here is a hypothetical mountain range, which is adjacent to a large body of water. So here's the ocean, here's the mountain nearby. As uh, warm, humid air blows from the ocean, onto the land, right? And it, um, it is humid because as we know, if it's warm, lots of water is going to evaporate. And so very high humidity in the water over the ocean, okay? The prevailing winds push this warm, humid air onto the land, where of course it encounters a mountain range, right? Air can't go through the mountains. And so it is pushed up the mountains, up and up and up. And as we know, um, as the air rises, Right, either because it's warm or because it's hitting these mountains, um, it is going to cool. Right? Again, this is a, the adiabatic process. Air is cooling as it reaches higher altitudes, and therefore it is going to reach its dew point. Okay? Um, as the dew point is reached, condensation occurs and precipitation occurs on this side, on the windward side of the mountain. Okay? Of course, the air doesn't just stop. The air keeps on moving over the mountain range, um, but now, just as we saw in all of those um, those cells, now the air has already dropped most of its moisture. Right? It's already precipitated on this side, and so what is left to descend the mountain range on the other side is very dry air. And so what this does is it leaves what is called a rain shadow on the leeward side. So um, on the other side of the mountain, okay? So even, um, you know, within a couple dozen, couple hundred miles, you can see very wet conditions and very dry conditions. And so we see that all over the world. Um, this is a map of Washington state. Um, so on the west side, of course, we have the Pacific Ocean. And over here, if you get into the Great Plains, okay, eventually get into the Great Plains. Um, here, Right. On the western side of the state is a mountain range. So when um, the westerlies right, push this warm, humid air off of the ocean and onto the land, the air, again, has to rise over the mountain range before descending on the other side. And what happens, of course, is that the air rises, it cools, condenses, precipitates, and leaves a very... Um, uh, very uh, rainforest like, in fact, it is a temperate rainforest environment on the west side of the mountains, the west side of the state. And on the east side, it leaves a rain shadow. And so this is actually um, a rain map here as well, right? So lots and lots of rain on the west side of the mountains, very little rain on the east side of the mountains. And so we can see this. Right? Remember that ecologists study uh, long-term climate patterns by looking at vegetation, not at meteorological records. And so here uh, is an image from the west side of the state, so very lush. There's moss and ferns and just like beautiful rainforest. But then on the west side of the state, it looks like you're in Nevada. Right? It looks like you're in the desert. In fact, you are. Uh, another place where we see um, similar phenomenon that is caused by this adiabatic cooling um, is in the North American Southwest. Uh, so in Arizona and New Mexico, um, so right around in here, uh, you almost definitely think uh, really hot and really dry, like, oh, it must never rain in those places. But in fact, every single afternoon in the summertime, 
it rains. And not even just a little bit of rain, okay, it's drizzling, but I'm talking flat out downpours every afternoon. Um, and so what is happening here? Uh, well, uh, of course, in the summertime, really warm, you get a lot of evaporation from the Gulf of California here, Mexico, and as well, um, the Gulf of Mexico, right, way over here. Uh, and so uh, the air that is rising off of those bodies of water is going to be very humid. Okay, That air, warm and humid, is blown up into Arizona and New Mexico. Now, this particular map is a, topo a topographical map. Uh, the green is lower in altitude. Um, the white and the brown is higher in altitude. And so, um, just as we keep saying, um, the air is going to encounter um, this uh, really steep incline, and therefore it must rise really quickly. And as we know, it's going to cool really quickly as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is another um, another graph of this. So here um, is Phoenix, which is um, less than 2,000 feet in altitude. Um, and then uh, as the wind, right, hot and humid, blows over Phoenix, it is going to encounter what's called the Muggian Rim. So really steep up um, cooling in the process, condensation, and precipitation. Right. So this entire place here, Mugging Rim, all the way to Flagstaff and beyond, gets these really severe thunderstorms every single afternoon. Um, and so here is the rain graph um, of Tucson, for example, so um, kind of the southern part of the state. Um, very little rain in the winter months and the first part of the summer, but then you see lots of rain, right, relatively for this part of the world um, in July, August, and even into September. Okay, so um, once again, uh, organisms that live in these environments have to be adapted to withstand um, very dry, um, hot, desert conditions for most of the year, but then they have to also be able to withstand um, these periods of um, kind of flash flooding and tons of water, um, tons of hard, right, and sometimes even hail um, all at once. Um, the proximity to a coastline is going to influence climate as well. And so let's, uh, let's think to uh, sitting on the beach. <laughs> All right, so if you're sitting on the beach during the day, you are going to experience very different conditions, of course, than sitting on the beach at night. And the reason for that, of course, is that the land heats and cools much faster than water. All right, so let's take a look here. Um, and hopefully my, my bird is not being too disruptive. Um, he loves when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so um, you're sitting on the beach during the day. Okay, and you might notice that course the wind is coming off the ocean and blowing into your face right so uh the wind coming from over the water right what's happening there why it is coming off of the water is that um the water um is essentially staying the same temperature over the entire day so it is going to be relatively cooler than the air around it and we know that it stays that way until like august and even into september sometimes Okay, so the water and therefore the air over the water remains cooler than the heat of the air over the land. The land heats and cools much faster. And so during the day, it is going to heat up quite a lot. And so the air over the land, sorry, oh my God. Um, so the land over the air is going to warm up and therefore it's going to rise, right? Cool air descends and it's kind of sucked into this low pressure environment left by the ascension of the warm air. And so um, once again, we get this convection current, warmer air over the land rising, filling in the low pressure environment left by the cool air descending and so on and so forth. And so the winds that you're experiencing on the ground are from the sea, from over the water. However, if you sit there long enough and the, the sun sets, you're still out on the beach at night, you'll notice that all of a sudden your hair is in your face. Again, sorry. Um, so your hair is in your face. And so what's happening here is that the land is going to cool off 
but the water stays the same temperature. So the water is now suddenly warmer than the surrounding air, the surrounding land. And so, um, as always, cool air descends, warm air rises, and we form this convection current. And what you're experiencing here on the ground is a land breeze. Okay, so um, take home message here. Water holds its temperature for a lot longer than the land does. And so land temperature is going to fluctuate considerably throughout the day and from season to season. Okay, and so in terms of season, um, a place that is close to the water is essentially going to be insulated or buffered against wide fluctuations in temperature, right, against season and even over the course of a single day. Um, a landlocked place, so here like St. Louis, um, it isn't near, you know, any huge bodies of water necessarily, um, and so it, um, the land is going to heat up and cool off a lot more than it would in San Francisco. And so here is a graph showing us uh, January through December. We can see that uh, the temperature remains fairly constant for San Francisco, or a little bit warmer in the summer, but then cools off again. Um, St. Louis, on the other hand, has a significant difference between the winter months, so temperature about zero degrees, versus about 30 degrees in the summertime. So much more variability when you are surrounded by all land versus when you are near a body of water, all right? So uh, we, of course, uh, are super uncomfortable and it's very uh, unexpected if we have a 50 degree shift um, in temperature from uh, from the uh, middle of the day to nighttime, but in other places in the middle of the country, much more common. Um, so this leads us to think about what are called microclimates. Um, microclimates are um, slightly different climatic conditions in like the very specific spot where organisms are living. Um, and so uh, you can go to the Grand Canyon where it is, you know, very dry except for those monsoons and um, you can still see lots of moss. Moss needs a lot of water. It doesn't have roots. Uh, and so you would think that moss wouldn't be able to grow in such a place like that. You'd think that ferns wouldn't be able to grow in such a place like that. But um, these organisms find microclimates, find little parts of the environment that have slightly different climatic conditions that actually facilitate their success. And so here we see that um, there are cracks in the mall, uh, I'm sorry, in the rock. And so in these cracks, it's a little bit more shaded, so not direct sunlight inside the little crack. Um, moisture is able to stay for longer, right? So maybe a little tiny puddle forms within the crack. Um, maybe that shade from, you know, the little bit of rock overhanging is going to um, reduce the evaporation of that water for a little bit longer. And so ultimately the conditions within this tiny little crack are different than the surrounding desert. And so moss is therefore able to grow in these tiny little cracks where it couldn't grow like on the surface of a rock in the full sun. Okay. Um, similarly, uh, you know, well, amphibian uh, that I saw on a hike a couple years ago. Um, he is ectothermic, so he needs to, um, you know, he changes his behavior based on the temperature. Um, this was first thing in the morning, so relatively cool, but he wants to get up and moving. He wants to get out and have his breakfast. And so he is going to warm up by finding one of those little sun flecks. Right, so what you can see here maybe is like one tiny little patch of sun and the rest of it is dark on all the other sides. And so a um, little salamander, a little lizard um, can bask in the sun in this tiny little sun fleck and therefore um, start his day a little bit sooner. So um, take home message here is that um, even though you know, the climate of the entire region is a certain way. If you zoom in, there are many different microclimates in which organisms um, may find more favorable conditions. Uh, final topic uh, for climate that I want to talk about is aspect. Um, so uh, thinking about microclimates, thinking about how um, 
one tiny portion of the environment might have different conditions than a neighboring portion of the environment and therefore one organism might live here a different organism might live here even though the climate of the entire region is a certain way okay and so here um we can think about the different sides of the mountain right so a different aspect or the direction of the slope um on one side of the slope you have certain types of conditions on the other side of the slope you have different types of conditions right? and of course um in places with rain shadows, this is very pronounced, um, but even in a normal mountain range, even in a mountain range that isn't right next to um, a large body of water, you still see variability from one side of the mountain to the other. Um, in all of these examples, we are looking at northern hemisphere mountains. Uh, so what that means is that the sun, for the most part, is coming from the south and the north is a little bit more shaded. Okay, So we can see um, this actually says north, I'm not sure where I got cut off, um, but the north side of the mountain, right? we can see like very green, very lush. Um, same thing down here, north, um, very green, very lush, but then the south side, this is getting a lot more sunlight, and so it's a lot drier, it's a lot warmer, and so you see um, different vegetation, different density of vegetation on the south side as opposed to the north side, right, similarly down here. Okay. Um, if we look at temperature, um, we see that the temperature varies considerably from north to south and also depending on whether or not there's vegetation. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this graph. I just want to point out that um, these scientists were comparing north slopes and south slopes and on each of those slopes with a forest or um, bare ground, right? so exposed north facing slopes. Okay, so uh, just a couple comparisons here. Um, S for south, forested versus exposed. Okay, so um, the southern forested slope, as we can see, stays cooler than the exposed slope. Right, so microclimates underneath the forest, um, this kind of um, again, buffers that temperature so that you don't get such wide fluctuations. The trees actually keep and insulate the land underneath it, All right? So exposed um, is going to get a lot hotter during the day, All right? Um, same kind of pattern on the north slope, forested stays cooler than the exposed, okay? When you look at north versus south, so look at forested first, um, the northern slope, takes a little bit longer to heat up in the day and it never actually gets as hot as the south facing slope right here in red okay um the exposed slopes we can see even more pronounced pattern here the north facing slope of course gets warmer than the forested but doesn't get nearly as hot as the south facing slope. So here, south exposed. Okay, so take home message here is that the aspect, right? What side of the slope, what side of the mountain are you on? North side in the northern hemisphere is going to be cooler, not as much sun, generally um, more humid. South facing slope, it'll be drier, it'll be hotter, um, gets a lot more sunlight. Okay, so that is all I have for you here. Uh, remember that at the end of the slides, there is a study guide. These are some of the learning outcomes that you should have um, for this particular section. Um, here are some terms that you should know and processes that you should describe for this particular content. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks.